Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning. I feel a bit like a mole. I'm pretty sure I'm the least techy person in this room. So uh, my name is Julia Rohrer. I'm currently a grad student at the Max Planck um, Institute for Human Development in Berlin, and so I'm a personality psychologist. And so today I'm going to talk a bit about how we can fix a scientific culture, but that title was a bit too ambitious. So actually I'm just going to talk about recent developments in psychology. So you've probably heard about that like so-called reproducibility crisis and it looks right now like psychology is facing a lot of like huge issues. Like are we even a science? I don't know, I hope we are. And so I'm going to talk about these problems, but also um, about possible solutions in the wider context of how we do science. And since I assume that most of you are somehow involved in science, this might be, well, this is hopefully irrelevant for you as well. So I'm a psychologist and we do experiments. So I want you to imagine you're now a participant in this experiment and you see two curtains. And behind one of those curtains, there is a picture of a blank wall and behind the other one, there is an actual picture. And now you have to guess behind which, which, pic, uh, behind which curtain you can find that picture. So you might go for left, and oh no, it's the blank wall, that's a miss. And so we try again, and this time it's a hit. Oh yeah, we found the picture, and that's great, we get one point. And so this is the basic setup, and now, now there is something special about that experiment. So the first thing is, some of the pictures are special. So we might choose the left curtain, and there's a picture with an erotic content. And so these are not the pictures from the actual study because I think the pictures were fairly explicit, but I wanted to keep this safe for work. And so the one thing is some of the pictures are special, but the other thing is, so how should you know where the picture is? Well, it's actually uh, randomized with a hardware-based uh, random number generator. And so there's no way you could know where the picture is. And now the researcher doing the study is interested in how many times you guess the position correctly. And it's kind of like, well, why would you need to run that study? Like, we know it should be 50%, right? It's just like a random number. You cannot guess the random number if everything is implemented properly. And so the only possibility that you would um, achieve more than 50% would be like some sort of special precognitive skills. Maybe you can see the future. And now the astonishing thing is, so this is a study that was published in one of our flagship journals, JPSP, by an eminent social psychologist, Daryl Bam, and that's exactly what he found. So across all 100 sessions, participants correctly identified the future position, position of the erotic pictures significantly more frequently than the 50% hit rate expected by chance. So they got it right 53% of the uh, times, and that perfectly makes sense that it only works for the erotic pictures because it's an evolutionary advantage <laughs> to be able to see um, the mating opportunities. And so this is like how oh, that's interesting. I mean, well, it, it's I, I wouldn't rule that out. Or actually, I would rule out that this works, but extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and that's what Daryl Bam provided. So it wasn't just one experiment; it was nine experiments. And it wasn't just like small experiments, but all in all, there were 1,000 participants involved. And so now you could say, okay, so most likely this is something about the random number generator, right? Something must be broken. But he was fairly like rigorous about uh, this. And I think the experiments, they took a long time. And so this is like probably the most bizarre thing I've ever read in a psychology journal article is like, he has that nice, um, so he distinguishes between like, precognition and clairvoyance and psychokinesis and how these things relate to different types of random number generators and what we would predict based on these things. And so this was published in 2011 and I know that quite a few people were like, huh, what do we make out of that? It's our most prestigious um, journal, at least in social and personality psychology, and they published this. And so there's a study following the best practices published in a flagship journal, and it shows that precognition is real. Well, one possibility is like, okay, precognition is real. We just have to accept that it's significant. And the other thing is, well, maybe precognition is not real. And personally, I have a lot of trust in the work of physicists. So I would rather go for maybe psychologists are wrong here, and maybe there might be something wrong with our best practices. And so the question is, what, what exactly is wrong about our practices? And to understand that, you have to understand how psychologists do statistics. 
and it's a very simple thing. That is, for example, we observe an effect in the data. We observe that participant get the picture right in 53% of the cases. And now we compare that to a null hypothesis, and the null hypothesis is normally there's no effect. So in this case, the null hypo hypothesis would be it's 50% actually in the population, and so this like 53% might just be random flu fluctuation, just like random noise. And so what we do is like, we calculate how likely it would have been to observe that effect, given that the null is true. And if that turns out to be more than 5%, then we say our p-value is not significant, and so we do not reject the null hypothesis because the data could have occurred under the null in more than 5% of the cases. But if the p-value is below these 5%, well, then it's significant. And so we reject the null hypothesis of no effect, and we establish the effect exists. And so this is not exactly sophisticated, but if you do that properly, so you run a study on an effect and you test it and you do it again and again and again, then what you ensure is that the long-term error rates are controlled. And in this case, you will ensure that if you investigate something and there's actually nothing going on, it's all just noise, then you only wrongly conclude that there is an effect in 5% of the cases, which is nice, so this is long-term error control. The thing is, this is not how psychologists run their studies. But, and you probably all know that when you run a study or analyze data, there are some like degrees of freedom. And so, for example, psychologists might decide to include more than just one outcome measure. So, for example, if you use a questionnaire for personality, well, there are different ways to measure personality. And so you might just include a bunch of questionnaires. You might also just like start your experiment and then you see the trend you predicted. Oh, but it's not yet significant. So you just collect a few more participants and test again. And, um, they are fairly innocent things like, oh, maybe this is confounded by gender, so we have to statistically control for gender effects. Or maybe it's just like you tried a few more things, but you see that some conditions in your experiment just don't work, so you just drop them and never talk about them again. And then, of course, you can combine all of the above. But what does that to our false positive rate? So the false positive rate could be somewhere between like 0%, we never have a false positive if there's no effect, and 100%. Every time there is an effect, we will always con no effect, we will conclude there is one effect, which would be fairly bad. And so this bright blue line is the 5% we are aiming for. And now each of these practices results in slightly more than those um, 5%, actually considerably more, so we go up to 10% of false positives. And now the, the scaring thing about that is if you combine all of the above, you can get up to 60% in that specific simulation. And I'm fairly certain you can get it up even higher if you try really hard. So that kind of means like with a, with a creative approach to data analysis, you can get anything significant if you want to. And there's actually researchers in psychology who just know that and are like boasting, I can get anything significant. Although don't tell anyone that I told you that. So you probably know that, but psychologists kind of had to learn that this is what's happening. And we um, coined a term for that, that is um, p-hacking because you're hacking your p-values till it's below that threshold. Though I think some people don't like the term because it sounds like it's super intentional and it's probably not that intentional. Also, I think psychologists don't quite know what hacking means, so they think it's like evil people sitting in front of the uh, PC with maybe wearing a mask or something like that. So um, we have some other terms we are using, for example, questionable research practices, QRPs, um, which is a bit broader, just like the name says. And there was one blog post to use the term noise fitting, which uh, noise mining, which I like a lot because it's like going through the noise and see whether you can find something that looks precious. And um, one term that was used by Talia Coney that I like a lot because it's just like very precise is procedural overfitting because this is what is happening. We are overfitting our data, but it's not a problem with our model. It's the problem with the procedure that we just try many models and throw in more variables and then stop when something is statistically significant. So um, we kind of now know that this procedural overfitting is pretty problematic because you could kind of find like anything you want. But the question is, do psychologists really work that way? I mean, maybe it's just a few bad apples. So this is an empirical question, and there was actually like a male survey of um, 2,000 psychologists at major US universities. And so what they basically did, they asked them for um, a number of different uh, behaviors, such as failing to report all dependent measures, 
But even stuff like rounding down p-values, which I find fairly bad, um, up to falsifying data. And now you can imagine it's not that easy to ask people, oh, hey, are you uh, failing to report all dependent measures? So they did different things to estimate the prevalence of these behaviors, but we're actually going to stick with the self-admission rate, which is like the darkest bar, because actually people just admit to it. So what you can see here is that more than 60% say, oh yeah, I failed to report all dependent measures at least once. And for example, some people, like more than 20% say, oh yeah, I stopped data collection after achieving the desired result. And uh, selectively reporting studies that worked, which this is also fairly prevalent. So you see people even self-admit that they are doing these things. So this is kind of troubling because we know that if you do these things, you can basically find anything in noise. And so what does it mean for our findings? What does it mean for our literature? And so the question is, is it really that bad, though? And so there was a large scale effort to answer that question. And this is really like an awesome um, project by the Open Science Collaboration. So they tried to replicate 100 studies published in um, some of our major journals just to estimate how reproducible is our research. And now there are different ways to assess whether these replications were successful or not. We can look at the p-values because it's kind of so important in psychology. And so what you see here are the p-values of the original studies. And as you might imagine, they are all below, below our, like almost all below our significance threshold because we only publish stuff that we consider significant. But now if, the, you, if you look at the replication studies, they are actually all over the place. <laughs> and so this is kind of bad. So we had like 97% of original studies that reported significant effect, but only 36% of the replications. And of course, it's not just the p-value. You can look at other things as well to summarize your evidence. And so, for example, if you look at the mean effect size of the replications, they were like half the magnitude of the original mean effect sizes. So even if there is something and the study just failed to detect it, it would be considerably smaller. And um, now, there was a lot of arguing about um, this open science collaboration. And somebody claimed that the data is perfectly compatible with uh, the viewpoint that everything is replicable in psychology, and this is just like random fluctuation, whatever. But it's actually not limited to that one large scale effort. There are many um, popular findings that were not able to replicate, including some things that got a lot of media exposure um, thanks to TED Talks. And so this is fairly bad because we would assume that proper science replicates in some way. And though there are people in psychology arguing, well, you cannot step into the same river twice. If that's true, I'm, I'm fine with that, but it would mean that we should stop giving policy advice or any sort of advice to anybody. But actually, there's even more going on. So you don't even have to try to replicate a study to figure out that something's really off. You can just actually look at the studies. And so um, there's the software, um, Static, and you can just feed it a PDF of a manuscript that is formatted in APA style, which is what everybody in psychology does. And it will just like extract the significance tests and check whether the numbers are consistent. consistent. So do the numbers you report even like add up? And so there have been different attempts to um, estimate how often numbers do not hold up. So how many articles have um, inconsistencies and what you can see here, it kind of converges to 50%. So at least half of our papers have like statistical inconsistencies. And so that's just like, nobody's looking at the data at that point. It's really just looking at the numbers in the papers. So that is kind of really sloppy, but maybe, I mean, maybe it's just like copy and paste errors, whatever. So maybe there's nothing problematic about that, but actually there seems to be like a system to that. And there are some fairly prominent cases where just nothing holds up. And so one example um, for that is the Cornell Food and Brand Lab that is run by Brian Wansink. And they have those really nice infographics, um, really catchy, like food TV watchers are 11 pounds heavier, oh, but only those who cook a lot. Um, you can probably already imagine how that result was found. But anyway, Brian Wansink did a lot of work on consumer behavior and food marketing. He wrote a book on, I, I don't know, either mindless or mindful eating, one of the two. He had a White House appointment as the executive director of the USDA Center for Nutrition Policy, and he oversaw the development of the 2010 dietary guidelines. So you can be fairly sure, oh, wow, that's, that's an influential scientist, right? 
So he must do some pretty fine science there. And so there's this kind of tragic story. It all started with a blog post called The Grad Student Who Never Said No, which is already like a really bad title for a blog post. Don't do that. <laughs> and so he describes how a grad student visits his lab and he kind of explains how he got her to pee hack the hell out of their data and then how she got four publications out of that and how this is like a really good approach and how this is how you become a successful scientist. So people in the comment section of that blog post were like, wait, wait, this is satire, right? Like you're, you're joking here, right? But he was serious about that being like the best approach to do productive science. And so that is kind of troubling. So um, three researchers went through those four paper, papers and wrote a preprint on that. I, I don't know whether that's accepted yet. It's called Statistical Heart, Heartburn, or it was called like that. And so they found 150, 150 numerical inconsistencies in those four papers. And I don't even know whether I could manage to get that many inconsistencies into four papers. And now one could say, okay, maybe that's just like, maybe that's a problem with that grad students. I mean, maybe her training wasn't that good, whatever. But actually it seems to be something about Brian Wansing because people now started to look at the rest of his publications. And so there are errors in at least of 45 of his publications. And, um, they are cited quite a bit. And so some of the things are really very minor. So it's things like, oh yeah, the gender ratio report is not possible with that sample size, whatever, just like, okay, maybe you excluded participants without reporting it. But there are also some major issues, like he reports exactly the same numbers, but describes a completely different study. And so how could that ever happen that you get the same numbers in a completely different study? At least in psychology, that normally does not happen. And my favorite one is like, so he had a study um, that was about like cool rebranding of school foods. And so they rebranded um, carrots as, as like, I don't know, like X-ray vision carrots. And um, supposedly that increased the numbers of carrots that were being consumed. And so somebody, um, James Heather, just looked at the numbers and you just have like the summary stats and try to come up with a distribution of numbers that could generate these summary stats. And so he tried to figure out like the maximum number of carrots taken. And so the numbers in that study are kind of just possible if one of the children had like around 60 carrots for lunch. And so it was probably baby carrots, but it's still a lot of carrots for a school child. And so I think the problem here is not that it seems like he either does not know how to work with numbers or that he does not care enough. But the troubling thing is that he got into that position where he's running his own lab and giving policy advice, so it's some sort of collective failure. And so wait, there's even more. So even if you get the numbers right, and even if you don't p-hack your data, there are actually a lot of problems with many things we do. And so there is this beautiful um, syllabus by Sandre Srivastava that is called Everything is Fuck, the syllabus. And it's actually a pretty good method syllabus, so you can use that for a journal club. But it kind of ends um, with instructions for finals week, so wear black and bring a number two pencil. And this kind of summarizes how many people now think about psychology. Oh, wow, this is really bad. Yeah, well, everything is fucked. Our science is broken, and this is our darkest hour. But I actually think it's probably not the darkest hour because all these developments over the course of the last maybe six years have led to a lot of like scientific introspection. And now people are actually thinking really hard how are we doing science? How did we get here and why are we doing that way? And how can we fix it? So there's this idealized circle of how science is supposed to work. You generate, you generate your hypothesis, you design a study, you conduct a stu the study and collect the data, then you analyze, then you interpret the results, and then you either publish that or if it's still ambiguous, you conduct the next experiment to figure out what's going on. And so we are failing at many points here. We fail to control for bias in the very beginning. Then we design studies in a way that even if there was an effect, we could never find it because we have such low statistical power because we are running studies with like 40 participants across three conditions or something like that. So there's very poor quality control um, when we run those studies. So nobody knows whether we really properly did what we claim we did. And then people just pee hack the hell out of their data. And then um, p-hacking goes very well with hacking. So hacking is hypothesizing after the results are known. So you um, 
PAC till you find something in your data, and then you come up with a nice post hoc story why that would have been predicted from a theory. And then you reframe your whole paper in a way that it sounds like you exactly predicted that weird triple interaction because of evolutionary science, whatever. And then you just have a nice confirmatory paper. And so to make this all worse, there's publication bias on top of that. So it's kind of, if you don't do that, you probably don't get published anyway. So the negative evidence or the lack of evidence never gets out there anyway. And so this is pretty dark. It means there are many things going wrong, but that also means that there are many ways we can try to fix that. And I'm going to talk about some ideas that have been brought up to fix these issues. So um, one very large problem is that what um, Loken and Gelman call the garden of forking paths. So you have data, but there are so many ways to analyze it, and there are so many decisions you can make, and some of them are really arbitrary. So one solution to that is constrain yourself to walk only one of the paths so you don't get led astray and get lost in the woods. And so that idea is pre-registration, and it's exactly what the name says. So it's a timestamp document describing what you're going to do, and you do that before you run your study. So you make it public. I'm going to run the study. I'm going to collect X participants, and I'm going to analyze it this way, and I predict this and that. And that makes a lot of sense, and you can even take that to the next level, and then you have registered reports. So this is a new type of publication, and it works like this. You develop an idea, you design the study, you write an introduction se uh, section and a method section, and then this is peer-reviewed. So before you've collected the data, you will get feedback, you can um, adjust it. And if it passes this stage one peer review, your paper is accepted in principle. So no matter what you find, this will get published. And then you collect the data, you write a report, and there's a second stage um, peer review just to make sure. I mean, you could still kind of totally twist the story, so just to make sure that you actually uh, stuck with it. And then you, have, um, you publish the report in the end. And I think this makes a lot of sense, um, in particular in experimental research, because it avoids all that problems with p-hacking and hacking, but also kind of fixes publication bias, because no matter what you find, it will get published. And I think just last week, the first medical journals started accepting these, and there are already many um, journals in psychology who are now accepting these as a new format, and there's actually a social psychology journal, um, I think it's called Comprehensive Results in Social Psychology, and they only do registered reports now. And so that is one solution um, to deal with that garden of forking paths. And there's another one. So for example, I don't do um, experimental work. I analyze data that is already existing. And there are so many ways to analyze um, this data. And sometimes it's really just arbitrary decisions. So another way is what you can do is like walk all the paths and then transparently report what you did. So um, Gelman has called that idea like a multiverse analysis. And so you kind of try everything that seems reasonable. You see how different model specifications um, affect your conclusions, and then you try to integrate that knowledge. And so, for example, we tried that. So I do research on birth order effects of personality, and there are so many ways that people analyze these birth order effects, and it kind of seems arbitrary, and people come up with weird three-way interactions, so maybe people are using these degrees of freedom, and so you can't really see it, but what we did here is we tried all sorts of specifications. So for example, some people say you have to um, exclude SIP ships where the age gaps are too large because if the age gaps are too large, it's not like normal siblings. So we tried that. We also looked at SIP ships of different sizes. We only counted like full biological siblings or also put in like social siblings and so on. And we just kind of tried everything. We ran between family analysis, within family analyses. And then what you just see is like, we ran a lot of analyses. The red ones are the ones that ha like meet the conventional significance threshold. And so for example, you could see, oh, there's not much happening here. So most of the specification gives you no um, significant effects. And because psychologists really like p-values, you can actually calculate one p-value for that whole curve. And so that probably helps if you want to communicate with psychologists. So like these are potential solutions to solve those like problems with the data analysis and psychology, but I think we have um, more issues that go a bit deeper. And so psychology really is a bit like a secret science. So people don't exactly describe what they did. People don't share their methods. People don't share their data. And that causes 
a lot of issues in many situations. And people even feel like, oh, why do you want to see my data? Don't you trust me? I mean, you can just believe me that these results are true. And it's just like, this is not how science can operate. So the easy solution to that is, of course, to open up. So um, we need to get people to share their data, but also share their methods. And that includes, like, for example, the stimuli, like the picture you use in experiments, also the questionnaires you develop, and also the software you're developing or the experiments you programmed. And that has, like, if, you, if people started to share these, that would have the nice side effect that we don't have to reprogram the wheel over and over again, because many people are running the same experiments, but everybody is programming it themselves. And I think this is like the bare minimum. So people should share their analysis scripts, even if they don't share their data, because like having a script is a much more precise um, description of your analysis than just verbalizing, oh, I did a regression. And then you probably om omit what exactly you did. And you can't do that with an analysis script. So if we want people to do that, we have to make it kind of easier for them, because psychologists are not the most techy people. So I know that there are some people who are able to use GitHub, but it's certainly not the norm. And so one way um, that is very easy actually right now is the open science framework that has been developed by the Center for Open Science. And so I just have like a copy of a project I did. And so you can upload all your data there. You can upload your scripts. You even have like a small wiki function where you can confess that you actually did not use Python, but R instead. Um, and it's actually like a really nice solution also to issues with, with the workflow because it also has version control, which is a pretty huge thing for psychologists, I guess. So it's kind of new for us. And um, it has many nice features that are somehow tailored to the needs of researchers. For example, um, you can keep it private, you can make it public, but you can also generate a link for blinded peer review so that reviewers don't know who you are. And you can actually even like make your pre-registration exactly there, so you can create a timestamp document of the whole project, but also like add a form where you describe what you're going to do next. And um, we also now have a preprint server, and that also wo nicely works with the open science framework. So this is super nice, so now it's actually easy for people to um, use it, but we still need to get people to use it, and how do we do that? And one answer, it seems somewhat silly, but it seems to work, are badges. So I don't know what it is about badges, but my boyfriend plays those like browser games and they just get like silly badges. And he's like, no, I still need to get my badge today. So it, it seems to work. And so some journals, um, including one of our flagships, Psychological Science, and now give badges. So if you share your data, you get the open data badge. If you share your materials, you get the open materials badge. And I guess the best one is the pre-registered badge. Not many people get it these days, but it means that you pre-registered your study. And so it actually kind of seems to work. So what you see here on the y-axis is the um, number of articles that report that the data is available. And on the x-axis is just time. And that red line indicates when psychological science introduced um, these badges. And so the black line is psychological science. And even if you can't really see it, you will see this. So um, data sharing really went up after they introduced those badges. So it kind of seems to work for some weird psychological reason. And well, sometimes you want probably to add some more nudges, or psychologists don't like the term pressure, but probably also some more um, pressure. And one thing is the peer reviewers openness initiative. And that, in my opinion, that makes a lot of sense. So the reasoning is if you peer review a paper, I mean, you kind of vouch for the things that are reported in the paper to be correct. So you actually should be able to access the data and rerun the analyses. So, um, so far, I think 440 people have signed this. And now, if one of the reviewers of your paper happens to be uh, in that pro initiative, they will contact the editor and say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to review that paper, but I would need the data to do that. Can you please contact the authors and say they should please upload the data? And there are reasons to not share data. So I think some of you are working in the industry, so you know that there are opt obstacles to sharing data, and that is perfectly fine. So in the pro initiative, um, we want people to actually declare if they cannot share the data for certain reasons. And that's okay. You just have to make it explicit and not just like hide it away. 
And so this is like another idea that makes a lot of sense, um, to me at least. And so when we talk um, about these things to undergraduate students, they're always like, yeah, well, of course you should do that. Of course you should pre-register. Well, I thought you were doing that all of the time anyway. And isn't this how you should do science? Isn't that the rational thing to do? And so that kind of raises the question, I mean, how, how did we end up in that kind of bad situation that everything is kept secret and that like people kind of p-hack their data even though they should know that it doesn't work that way? And so how, how did we get here? And so I think what we can all like imagine is it's not like people make that conscious decision, oh, I'm going to pre-register my study. Oh, no, no, instead I'm going to p-hack it to hell. Because I, I think we can assume that most people um, in, in science in general, but also in psychology, want to do proper science. And so one possible explanation for that was offered in a paper by Paul Smoldino and uh, Richard McElrath. And I think it kind of makes a lot of um, sense. It's the natural selection of bad science. So why would there be natural selection in science? Well, you need um, three preconditions to have natural selection to occur, and that is heritability, variation of type, and uh, competition for limited resources. And so we do have heritability in some sense in science, because, for example, I learn how to run studies and how to analyze data from my advisor. So he passes on his knowledge about how science works. And then there certainly is variation of types. So some labs are already doing these like really rigorous studies where they like triple check everything and run study after study to make sure they are not just like uh, p hacking uh, without wanting to do that. And there are other labs who are probably less rigorous. And there certainly is competition for limited resources, such as faculty positions, but also grants and so on. And so what now happens is we kind of start out with um, senior researchers and some of them will teach low effort research just because that's what they are doing. And so that will lead to junior researchers who also do that like low effort research. But now the crucial thing is that low effort research, though it's not good science, it will probably allow you to publish more. Like you get more papers out there if you run very small studies instead of doing really rigorous studies. And now we have selection by publication of number, uh, by, by number of publications. So those researchers who published a lot, oh wow, this is like 100 papers, isn't this impressive? They are more likely to um, end up with their own lab and will end up uh, getting a lot of resources. So they actually end up being senior researchers who have a lot of junior researchers to whom they can like pass on their ways and their secret tricks. And so like this, you can imagine over time, if um, the system works like that, th the effort will go down. And in the end, you end up with everybody doing low effort research. And so actually what Richard told me is when they did that study, they kind of thought, now we tweak the whole thing and add replications and show that replications can save science. So the idea was you um, like change the simulation in a way that half of the studies that are being run are replications. And if something you did does not replicate, then you get a penalty. And so they thought this could like change something about the way that effort develops. And so on the x-axis here, you just have like time. So this is just like iterations of that simulation and you have effort. And actually it doesn't really matter whether there's that like number of replication, like 50% of replications is actually just crazy. But even that does not prevent the effort going down. And so this looks kind of dark because it kind of predicts that no matter what we do, it will go down. And so what can we do? And it's, so one thing is, of course, think hard about how we select people because the number of publications, you can imagine that is probably not like the best thing to measure that. But it actually means like think really hard about it because if you just change it and okay, we are not just looking at the number of publications, but probably also the impact factor. Well, you can imagine that that again just goes wrong. And so you probably have heard of Goodhart's law. So when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And I think this is like a general truth. And um, I got an example from that super nice book, Algorithms to Live By. And it just seems like an instance of that human tendency to overfit. So take, for example, fencing. So the original idea behind fencing is that you are able to defend yourself in a duel. So it's defensing. But then they turned it into a sports and now they have um, electronic scoring equipment, so little buttons at the top, at the tip of the blade. And so you just have to kind of like poke your enemy to get a point. And so obviously, um, 
sensors will now try to optimize um, this number, like, so the result of the electronic scoring equipment. And though the scoring equipment kind of correlates with what you were originally interested in, like defending yourself, it's not exactly the, the same thing. So what will happen is that people start to fence in a different way, so they will have like some quirky moves just to get more points. And that kind of defeats the original purpose, though it's still an interesting sport, so that's probably not too problematic. But now if you apply that to science, so our scoring equipment might be the number of publications, also the impact factor of the journals that we publish in. And so it, it certainly does in some way correlate with um, scientific productivity or the quality of our science, but it's not exactly the same. So what people will obviously do is try to maximize that scoring number. So they will try to publish as much as possible in the best journals. And so just like for fencing, this results in something that might look elegant and give the impression of fencing, but it does not serve the original purpose anymore. It does not lead to good science anymore. And so um, this is like, I think, one thing we have to think about really hard because I don't think there's an easy solution to that. And so another thing that is in a similar vein is grant culture. So if you think about it, so... Like our current grant culture rewards researchers who oversell their research because that increases your chances to get a grant. And also kind of rewards spending a lot of money because if you want to get large grants, you need to do expensive research and having a lot of big grants kind of looks really good on your CV. And if you look at that from a, like, a bird's eye view, then it's like really weird. Like this is set up to go horribly wrong. And so there's been a pretty nice paper by Scott Lilienfeld on the like just like complaining about the side effects of grand culture and psychology. And it's a lot of things that have a lot to do with uh, the current crisis that is, for example, it heightens the incentives for QRP, so for these questionable research practices. It also disincentivizes, uh, disincentivizes um, direct replications because you normally do not get money for that. And it kind of just like diminishes your time to think deeply because it causes so much overhead not only for the applicants, but also for the reviewers, and there's that huge administrative burden. So the whole grant system really doesn't se uh, seem to work very well, and it kind of seems to like, hurt science and at the same time be very expensive. And so there have been multiple proposals how to um, fix that. For example, there was this suggestion for an alternative funding system. So the idea is kind of, so you have a certain budget and you actually just distribute it among all researchers, so everybody gets the same but everybody has to pass on half of it to somebody else that they are doing is good research. So scientists decide themselves who gets funded, and they are doing that now as well, but now it's with those weird like review um, boards, and like this it would become also way more transparent. And the thing is, if you get a lot of money from the others because they are thinking you're doing fine research, that means you will have more money, but it also means that you still have to pass on half of what you get, so you also get to distribute more money. And so that is one idea to go from these like funding agency agencies to scientific agency. And there have been other suggestions how to fix that. So for example, just like fund everybody, fund based on merit, and you can probably also already imagine what could go wrong with that if we are not quite able to measure merit. Um, but also like one idea that kind of makes sense to me is just filter out the worst proposals because some are really crappy, but you can't really say, oh, is this the top 1% or the top 5%? We are not that precise in our judgments. So you could just submit the rest to a lottery. And uh, one other thing um, that would probably already solve a lot of issues is uh, starting to ignore grant portfolios and hiring promotion and evaluations because it's just like that really weird thing that you need to prove that you are able to spend a lot of money to, um, for example, become a professor. And so it's kind of really sad. So I know some people who do like really, really, really good and rigorous research. And uh, the only problem they have is that they are using existing data sets like the Biobank from UK. And so it kind of means like, ah, it's not quite competitive on the job market. You're just doing too much good research for too little money. And so I think that would be one thing we could easily fix. So um, putting all these things together, so this is where we want to go, and there are many different ways we could try to get there. So for example, we could have um, single researchers who commit to change their practices, and we do have that in psychology, which is great. But we also need institutions to change, for example, um, 
like how do you phrase your job ads? And there have actually been now some um, job ads in Germany that explicitly called for applicants that can demonstrate that they did open replicable science. So this is, I think, a huge step because it changes the incentives. And it's also, of course, departments who might have to rethink their hiring criteria. And it might also be journals who have to think about which papers do we want, what do we accept, do we really only want the flashy findings, or maybe do, do we want to, to publish actual research. And uh, it's also, of course, about scientific um, associations, because the way they are handing out prices right now, for example, for junior researchers might send the wrong message. And um, taking it even to like a higher level, of course, it would be nice to have funders on board. And this is, for example, happening right now in the Netherlands, who are really progressive um, with these things. So the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research now has like some money that is specifically for direct replication of previous findings. And so it's not much, but I think it sends that signal that we do value replications and so on. And so as you can imagine, I don't know whether this is like a general law, but there is already some disagreement bec um, between the people who want to like improve psychological science. So we are already getting into like tough wars about how we do that best. And I actually think that's a good thing that we have some disagreement, which are like the most important steps, because I, I think it um, just stresses that we cannot expect an easy answer. And that's probably a good thing because that whole checklist mentality, oh yeah, the p-value needs to be below that and then it's a finding, or like an applicant has to have 10 publications, then it's a good applicant and so on. That whole checklist mentality got us into these troubles in the first place. And I think now it's um, up to us to realize that it's way more complex than that and that it's probably way harder to do proper science than we thought it is. So um, now I'm happy to answer your questions if you have any. Or tell me that psychology is not science. <laughs> Okay, so the question was whether like fixing that issue about statistical power and increasing statistical power um, wouldn't like wouldn't that solve a lot of these issues? And I agree that it would solve quite a few issues, including that p hacking, um, because it becomes unnecessary. But it's kind of limited in that sense. So um, there are things like just like confounders and bad designs and so on. And if you have like a stable confounder or a design flaw, like even sampling millions of people won't fix that. And so, for example, I'm working with fairly large samples, but uh, that actually kind of makes the issue of statistical confounding even worse. So it doesn't solve everything, but some parts, certainly. There's a statement, I guess, attributed to a British economist called Good Heart Small, that any metric that you use, the moment it becomes a target, becomes absolutely useless as a metric. So the question is, um, for example, impact factor, is a, it's not necessarily a terrible metric as such, but it's just that the moment people start gaming it, it becomes absolutely awful. So do you think like some of the metrics that you propose like avoid this, or do we just have to rotate metrics every once in a while? Okay, so the question is if every like metric that we use becomes kind of corrupted, then are there any metrics that solve that issue, issue or do we have, just have to like change the metrics randomly or whatever so people cannot predict it? And I think that's a 
really, really hard question. So I think there is that general truth, like whenever the metric becomes explicit, it will be gamed in some way. And you cannot like catch everyone who's gaming that. So um, I know it's not very satisfying, but um, I'm a proponent of looking at applicants like really thoroughly. And so this is kind of wacky because I'm a personality psychologist. So we try all these standardized questionnaires and uh, like develop criteria for diagnosis and so on. But I, in some sense, I do think we cannot have hard metrics for all these things. So there will always be like the human part and the human interview. And I think this is super important. <laughs> And so this is really weird because we really are like, oh, no, we need objective criteria. Every, anything else would be unfair. But the objective criteria are unfair as well. So we need some sort of mix. And maybe, so that's also like probably also bad advice, but not make it too explicit what you're looking for. Because in that second, people will try to pretend that they have that skill and then it gets hard to figure it out again. I'm nervous. I'm the first one of the mic. Um, <laughs> thank you for your talk. I thought it was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Um, you touched a little bit about the hered hereditary nature of having a supervisor that teaches you. Do you have any thoughts or, or comments about the role of education in terms of best practice and things like that? So I think education is super important because we do learn a lot of practices during our undergraduate studies and so on. And so I do think this is like one huge thing. We have to make sure that um, people know how to use these methods and have um, proper method, uh, proper method teaching. And that is kind of problematic right now because of course, through that whole like kind of bad system, we do have quite a few people who teach methods who don't fully understand them. So we actually do have textbooks in psychology, like stats textbooks that get things objectively wrong. And so we kind of have to fix that, but it's kind of hard to bootstrap it because we have so many people who really don't fully understand stats. But there are many people um, giving like really great um, lectures. And I know for, for a fact that some people are like, I'm not going to try to fix the old people, right? I mean, they are going to die one day anyway. So I'm focusing on teaching and making sure that the next cohort knows how to do better. <laughs> Okay, uh, just let me remember what I wanted to ask. Ah, yeah. Uh, so we, we discussed a bit the, the entire issue with metrics and the fact that as soon as it, it becomes no, known as such, it's something that can, can be gamed and can happen virtually in any scenario. Um, your proposition with this crowd-based crowd funding was interesting because, I mean, the way you, you try to circumvent stuff like that, for instance, in governments, is not having like a centrally planned metric, but doing everything in a more free market uh, system, crowd-based system. Um, my question was, do you realize that a lot of the um, things which you might suggest, such as mandating or, or giving points or stickers for free data sharing, much, much as I agree with that, or even worse, requiring or highly incentivizing people to pre-register their studies. Uh, wouldn't you agree that this kind of contributes to the bureaucratization of science and to the establishment of, uh, of rigid metrics, which not only can be gamed, but uh, work against uh, encouraging creativity, simply because when you have a good idea, it might not fit the present metric system. So I very much agree with that, and I also see that this is something happening right now. So I'm working with pre-existing data, and now people were like, oh, that means we cannot get the pre-registered badge, and maybe we can come up with something similar for our type of research. And so I, I think that is like a real risk that we are now just imposing new standards that are like just absolute, and you have to do that. And so it's kind of like that metrics problem again. So. Um, it's hard to fix that. I always think that common sense would actually get us a long way. Like, for example, of course, that person never pre-registered, but that is not a bad sign because that person is using pre-existing data sets and so on. So it really depends on how we communicate these things. And I know that there's now like I'm a strong push to make it, oh, it's so easy to do that and you should really do that and it looks really good if you do that. But we should again like just make sure that people don't start to confuse those badges with the actual science happening. So it's a bit like that thing, like confusing the finger pointing at the moon with the moon. 
So we have to make sure that people are still able to evaluate the science without just looking at the badges and counting how many badges you got. Yeah, to take up uh, the very last sentence of your great talk, um, I guess a majority here is rather from the heart or nerd sciences, and there is a risk that we look down to something like psychology. And uh, I would say um, we have a quality problem everywhere in science. Um, let me give you a few examples. I'm in condensed matter physics. Um, I recently started a collaboration with a mathematician and he checked my equations. And that surprised me because over the last 20 years uh, about a hundred of co-authors co-signed my manuscripts without ever checking what I had been doing. Um, example two, a colleague over 20 years published 150 papers and Accidentally, I find, found out that he used almost each of his experiments in two or three publications in parallel. Um, example three, last year I had to um, review a pile of grant applications. And in two out of ten applications, I found that the author, the applicant, cited some paper by third party to support the importance of his own research. And I looked up some of these references and found those papers did not at all support the importance of the applicant's research, but only cited him in passing. And so these people trust that the reviewer will never look in detail into the application. And um, this is a huge problem for all of us and in the long run endangers the funding and the freedom we enjoy. I, I very much agree. So I was just talking about psychology because I know most about this, but all the like issues with the whole system, like for example, why should any like reviewer really like take the time to look it up where there are no incentives right they push people to do that so i think there's the danger that other sciences develop the same problems and many already have them actually do you think it would be beneficial to incentivize people to publish their failed hypotheses and if so how how yeah, so I, I think it's super important that people publish that just because many of our, like, so if we run a meta-analysis, we actually have to have the null findings as well, right? So um, it, it's kind of like a trade-off. So um, people are also arguing, well, we can't just publish, like, everything because that will cause, like, a huge chaos. So I think we have to think about maybe new ways of publishing that don't cause such a huge issue. I mean, you probably all know, like you have thousands of PDFs on your computer with findings, whatever. And so I think we need a solution to be better able to integrate findings so that you can just publish, like I tried this, I found nothing, and make it searchable so that other people trying to do that can also find that. And so I think that like requires us to rethink how we publish because the current way that psychologists at least publish is super outdated. So it takes like years until findings out there, only the significant stuff gets published. And then it's a, like hidden away in a PDF behind a paywall. So we really have to rethink that. And we probably have to somehow incentivize people to share like the whole story. Right. So you also mentioned that uh, a lot of the time uh, applications for professors will depend largely on how much grant money you've been able to acquire in the past. Do you think that this largely stems from big US universities or other universities really using that as a slogan saying we have all the money, we are good universities and that uh, this is actually a public misconception that money equals good science and how do we, how would you propose to change that public conception? 
Okay, so it's a great question. I actually think that the universities, not only in the US, but also in Germany and UK, so it's kind of they are like running really low on money. So they actually need to, to have people bringing in money, right? So you need that o overhead from the project. So that's a huge issue. And then there's that huge prestige associated with the grants that is a huge problem. And so I actually don't know how to fix that without overhauling the whole way that academia works and changing the way we fund universities because that might be one source of that problem. I think it's a hard question. Um, I cannot give you an easy answer, but I think like one very easy step would just to no longer explicitly look at how many dollars that person brought in. Though I, I heard that universities have such a strong interest in that that they probably won't let you make that so it's really constrained in that sense um thanks for your talk and um, do you think there's a problem of uh, something called uh, moral hazard is um the physicist just said that there's uh there's people that or who win that are kind of bold They cite things in their own way and they get through. Mm -hmm. And every now and then there's a person who's concerned, or a referee who's digging into it deeper. And the worst thing that can happen to this person is, okay, he has to uh, submit his paper to another journal. Mm -hmm. But there's no, I, th there's just this incentive to being bold. And then in the end, the system supports these people with a number of publications. Um, and if, if, if there would be some moral standards or there, I mean, there, there's no, um, there's no number that, that might, um, grab this, but it's, yeah, an unfair game in the end. Yeah. So that's a very good point. And that is kind of like a, in some sense, a tragedy of the commons situation. So why you can have like free riders that just kind of like cheat a bit, but they don't get caught and so they reap all the benefits and so on. And so it's actually, it's also in that um, like natural selection of bad science paper. So um, what actually happens is why effort still goes down if you have those, like even if you have the 50% replications, the thing is some people will not get caught, right? And so they will still like get through with making those bold things you said. So just like hope nobody catches them. And so I think this is um, like in, in like a problem that um, comes up in many different contexts, right? So just people like fraudsters and so on. And so I think we can't 100% fix that because if we try to 100% fix that, we will have a lot of distrust and so on and we can't operate anymore. And um, so I personally do think that actually like morals and ethics play a role in that and i would always hope that the people who pursue a career in science are actually interested in science and not in pursuing that career and so i think one thing is so what um, brian nosek said at a conference a few years ago is like if you want to become famous or rich well you're at the wrong place here right And I think one solution to that is that may, is to make sure that there are job opportunities outside of academia. So I think in psychology, at least, it's a problem that many people do not see job opportunities outside of academia. And so they stick in academia, probably for the wrong reasons, just because they think, oh, it's easier than finding a job on the, on the open job market. And so I think that might not be not that much of a problem in other fields, because if you want to make a lot of money or like have a career and you're a physicist, you probably can find a job somewhere else. And so I think that is like part of the solution. But then I, I agree that you, I, so there will always be those people who get by and it's kind of unfair. And I think we cannot prevent that there will be some people gaming the system. That's not satisfying, is it? Uh -huh. Thank you for the talk. Uh, one more question. Do you actually think that science wasn't broken somewhere, somewhere? So basically, or put it another way, do you, can, can you say when did the science became broken? <laughs> or was it broken from the beginning? So I think that's very interesting. What, what's kind of interesting, at least about psychology, is that it is a very young science. So, um, so we have a very brief history, maybe just 100 years, so one might think. But, so there's kind of the problem that in the beginning, it was kind of more qualitative and very different norms and so on. And it, so it kind of broke 
on the way to becoming a proper science, I guess. And so it's hard to detangle that because it would say, okay, yeah, we become more and more scientific over time just because we're a young science, but then something goes horribly wrong in that process. Right? And so there are different, so some people also think it's kind of like, so sci uh, psychology is kind of premature. So we are not yet fully developed like the theoretical framework and everything, but we are already trying to imitate physics by having those stats and numbers and models and so on. And so I think that is one explanation that kind of makes sense. And um, if I actually, so it's not like papers got worse over the course of the last year. So if I go back and read papers of the 70s, that's pretty horrible sometimes. And actually there were people um, like raising all these issues already like in the 70s. So we could have known that for a long time, but we just now realize that it's a really huge problem. I just want to make a tiny comment on becoming famous and rich uh, doing science. So we all know that lots of people try to become famous, but I mean, I just want to give this the small fact. Uh, Paul Thompson at University of South California makes between half a million and a million a year uh, paid by the university. So you can also be bloody rich doing it academia. So I don't know what to say about this, but small comment. Oh, thank you so much for the great keynote and uh, answering all the questions. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you for the cool discussion.